evening and welcome to the last session of this year's Berwick Literary Festival. Thank you for joining us. It's been a busy few days. Uh, we've had the uh, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, the current Port Laureate, uh, Simon Armitage. We've had a theatre production. We've had books about slavery, about the East India Company. Uh, another book looking at a rather shabby post-application life of Edward and Mrs. Simpson. Uh, we've had a much more inspiring story of the 15-year-old Lottie Dodd, who first won Wimbledon in the mid-1880s, went on to win it four more times. And we've had books about a dog, a man's best friend, his dog, of course, and an uplifting story of how trees and nature can heal all of us. So thanks to all of the volunteers and supporters who've kept us going over the last few days. Uh, tonight's event is actually sponsored by Greaves Western Air, who are uh, Berwick's leading accountants and wealth managers. So thanks to them and indeed all the sponsors. My name is uh, Jerry Foley and as a former political correspondent, I'm delighted that the last book we're going to be talking about, the 10 prime ministers we never had, and it's written by Steve Richards, who is one of the most distinguished and astute political commentators in the land. And uh, Steve, myself, we go back a long way um, and he's written many a fine book and is a fine performer. So I'm going to encourage people by using the Q&A to have as many questions as they would like about this fascinating book. Before we get to that, when we're talking about people who've been talked about of getting to the very top, uh, I'm in Berwick, you're a big Spurs fan, down the road at St. James's Park, Spurs have won 2015, 2016 was the big moment, but Spurs decided to leave it to Leicester as a more popular choice. And it was back in the mid nineties under Keegan, of course, that uh, Newcastle came even close to winning a title. Yeah, yeah, you and I have missed uh, part of a football match to talk about <laughs> prime ministers we never had. It has ended and Spurs did win, as I think probably some viewers to this uh, event will know. Right, but well, let's start with the only chapter in the book, which is dedicated, devoted to two individuals, not surprising if I say their names are the Miliband brothers, David and Ed. As you say, both of them fundamentally very decent guys, but ambition intervened, left them feeling, in your words, miserable. Let's talk about David first. His real opportunity was 2007 to 2010. Gordon Brown had taken over as prime minister. David was foreign secretary. What went wrong? Before I do that, uh, Gerard, I should stress that this book is not the best prime ministers we never had. So, and, and there are of course 11 of them in 10 chapters because the Millibands are two in one uh, chapter. It's not the best prime ministers we never had, nor is it a counterfactual what would have happened if David had become prime minister. It's looking at why prime ministers we never had as much a soundtrack to our lives in many cases as the prime ministers talked about and analyzed as much as the prime ministers why they failed to make it why they failed to seize the crown um, and it begins with Brad butler and ends with jeremy corbyn all 11 i argue had a chance of becoming prime minister so with the Miliband, you are absolutely right i mean you and i probably both knew them when they were behind the scenes advisors. Um, and they were always more academic than fiery political figures. They were in the cauldron of the Blair Brown battle, but were more interested in ideas than, you know, what Brown was up to, what Blair was up to. But both became MPs at roughly the same time as the sort of Blair Brown energy was beginning to sap big time and people were looking to a younger generation. And both therefore had ambition thrust upon them. They didn't begin ambitious, but had ambition thrust upon them simultaneously really. And although they were relatively modest people, it went to their heads and they became ambitious and, to, and ended up aching for the leadership at the same time. Now, David's first chance to become prime minister, as you suggest, was when Gordon Brown, went through kind of huge waves of turbulence uh, when he became prime minister in 2007. And there were some in the Labour Party who could not really accept that Brown was prime minister and looked to David to lead a coup against Brown and to become prime minister. And David was backed by a lot of flattering columns saying, Gordon Brown is gonna lead Labour to defeat. David could save 
Labour. Mm. And as Foreign Secretary, he made a terrible mistake. He encouraged this talk and this hope amongst those who were attempting various coups. Do you remember James Purnell resigned, thinking yep. David was going to follow and so on? So he encouraged it and then didn't act. Now, I think he was wise not to have acted. I don't think he would have won. I think if he had tried to topple Brown, all hell would have broken loose. And I remember Peter Mandelson saying to me, the idea that David will be carried on into number 10 in a chariot with everybody cheering is a fantasy. And I think that was right. It would have just triggered a civil war. But David made the mistake of encouraging people to think he was going to do it. Okay, um, let's take him then, Steve, if I may, just from the point. So Gordon Brown loses 2010. There is a Labour leadership election. David Miliband thinks that he is the automatic choice and was surprised, stroke, very hurt, disappointed, when Ed Miliband decided, no, I could do a better job than David. I've always been in his shadow. Now is my time, not his. And against the odds, by being a better campaigner during that election, getting the unions on side critically, he won. Well, this is where the family drama becomes really sad. Um, they both fought that 2010 leadership contest. So David didn't try and topple Gordon Brown. He went into the leadership contest in opposition in 2010. And Ed Miliband has received a lot of criticism for going in as well. How dare he take on his elder brother? That has always struck me as wholly unfair. Because if you think about it, Labour leadership contests, well, certainly then, didn't happen very often. The last proper one had been in 1994. We were now in 2010, 16 years later. So why shouldn't Ed Miliband stand? He had been a cabinet minister. He had very different views to David. He was to the left of David, as Gordon Brown was to the left of Tony Blair. So I think it was entirely legitimate for Ed to stand. Obviously, the defeat for David meant he became a prime minister we never had before Ed. Ed continued to hope he would be a prime minister as leader of the opposition. And it devastated David. It devastated his wife, Louise. They've never really recovered. The relationship between the two brothers is still bad, I think better but still pretty bad and I, I put in the book I remember coincidentally being on a train to Newcastle um, and bumping into David and his wife and I said what are you doing and they said we're going up to the northeast for our farewell constituency dinner because they decided they not only had to leave politics they had to leave the country such was the mm. intensity of the relationship at that point going wrong and uh, they were both in tears during the conversation, I remember, as they reflected on what had well, happened. David Miliband was very much loved, I would say, in his constituency. You know, he was imposed as a Labour Party HQ candidate when they were looking for a safe seat when he became an MP in 2001. But he really worked that constituency. And I had many dealings with him, not only as a minister, but as a constituency MP. I've and had... Ed Miliband, as you say, Ed Miliband thought up until the exit poll on the night of the 2015 election that he was going to be prime minister or at least in with a shout of being prime minister in a hung parliament. Yeah. And he was in tears after the results came yeah. through. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tragic ending really because exactly. I mean, some people have said to me, you know, why have you put Ed Miliband and Neil Kinnock in this book? People, and indeed Jeremy Corbyn might come to him, but mm. people, memories go very quickly in politics. People forget that with Ed Miliband, he was the favourite to become Prime Minister during and at the very end of that 2015 election. And on the night of the election, he and his advisor, Stuart Wood, in his uh, constituency house in Doncaster, sat there and basically mapped out their entire government, who was going to fill junior posts and all the rest of it. And then the exit poll came out, predicting an overall majority for the Tories. And to say he was devastated, I think, understates the shock, the sense of a terrible, brutal rejection. And 
I think leaders who are rejected in this way never really get over it. I see Neil Kinnock occasionally, I don't think he's got over it, although he's recovered his former ebullience, uh, which he lost during mm. his time. We'll come to Kinnock later on, he certainly did. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, the, the Miniban thing is, was when I wrote that, I kind of felt quite sad as I wrote it. It's an astonishing story. Indeed, I would argue the stories of all the prime ministers we never had are in some ways more compelling than those of the prime ministers. And as I say with the Minibans, it's so weird that I think unusually for politicians, they set out in politics. They weren't tormented by ambition, like so many you and I have met. And yet at the end, ambition drove them towards a terrible denouement for each of them. You talked about compelling stories, and they're all compelling stories. And let's go to the only woman in the book, and that's Barbara Castle. Now, Barbara Castle was first elected as an MP in 1945, and she became a very significant minister under Harold Wilson between 64 and 1970, and again, when Wilson came back into power. Tell us a little bit about her, because her story is a very interesting one. It's it's fascinating. I should say again, and I need sorry, I'm not going to preface all my answers, but the reason there aren't more women in the chapters in the book is that the era covers a really male-dominated period in British politics. And obviously on the Tory side, two women might have qualified, Margaret Thatcher and Theresa May, but they became prime ministers. They haven't had another woman seen as a potential prime minister uh, or leader. They've now got Liz Truss, we, you know, but that's now. Um, and on the Labour side, it, you know, I agonised, and there's a long piece in the introduction about Margaret Beckett, Harriet Harman, Shirley Williams. But in the end, I had to be honest about it. Um, Shirley Williams never stood for a leadership contest, and she was a very odd figure. She was both popular and kept on losing elections. You know, she kept on losing <laughs> her seat. Um, and, and it was a, and so she never really had the chance to lead. Um, Margaret Beckett was acting leader when John Smith died or after John Smith died, but she was up against Tony Blair and there was only going to be one winner. Mm. And Harriet Harman never stood in a leadership contest, I think to her regret now. So I chose to include in the chapter Barbara, in the chapters Barbara Castle and was fascinated by her. I thought I knew her quite well, but I learned a lot. And in the end, what I did was to sort of compare her career with Margaret Thatcher and pose the question, why was it Thatcher that became the first woman prime minister rather than Castle? Because in the 60s, lots of people thought it would be Castle. And she had a much more compelling uh, career uh, than Margaret Thatcher when she became well, she was a very important uh, cabinet minister. And one thing actually, I was just rereading the book this morning. Um, one thing actually, apart from her cabinet career, uh, it was a result of decisions she took when she was transport minister about bringing in speed limits uh, and also yeah. the breathalyzer. And she got a lot of negative reaction. And in this weekend of all weekends, you quote a letter she got from someone disgruntled with a hand-drawn dagger dripping in blood and saying, we're going to get you, you old cow. So this abuse of MPs in the public eye goes back to the 60s. And it really struck me as, you know, what a horrible yeah. thing for a woman cabinet minister yeah. to get. Yeah, she got a lot of abuse. And I think I put in the book that it's a myth that this abuse started with Twitter. And um, you're right, in the light of the unbearable nightmare of what happened on Friday, um, there is a lot of talk now about politics becoming less tolerant. I'm afraid there was an intolerance around then too. Um, but she was astonishing. She was the first cabinet minister to uh, have the overseas aid department as a cabinet post. As you say, she was a radical and daring transport secretary. She was then, I think they call it employment or labor secretary, when of course she famously introduced in place of strife. And that was ahead of its time. And she was she was a sort of modernizing Labour figure. She wasn't from that Jim Callaghan, small L Labourist tradition, you know, via the trade unions. Um, she was, in a way, someone who believed in an active but quite modern state. So she supported 
British uh, Rail, but said it really needed to modernise its management. And she was into planning. She proposed a congestion charge, actually, years and years before it happened. But just um, on the point, so, Steve, if I may, just come yeah. across for one second, because we've got a lot of people to get through, but her downfall in retrospect really was her in place of strife taking on the unions effectively and finding that the cabinet support sort of drifted away from it. Famously, perhaps by Jim Callaghan, um, herself yeah. and Jim Callaghan never saw eye to eye. She was much closer to, to Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson, her got on really well. Um, yeah, she was ahead of the times, but she wasn't politically astute. And that was one of her, her flaws because um, you really need to prepare the ground if you're going to propose fairly radical reforms of trade unions in a party where trade unions wielded considerable power. Um, and she didn't clear the ground. She was always publishing papers with plans. As I said, she loved plans. And <laughs> this one was just too much. It was opposed by virtually the entire Labour cabinet. Michael Foote, a very close friend of hers, I uh, wrote a scathing piece in Tribune about her and it. And Jack Straw, when he reviewed a biography of Barbara Castle, much when Straw was foreign secretary, he said that finished her off. She never had a hope then of becoming leader. But it's a real, Jerry, if I could just say, it's a really interesting comparison, the Thatcher Castle one, because one of the conclusions I've drawn about the prime ministers we never had is this, that you can almost be too weighty as a figure to become a leader, because if you're a big figure in a cabinet, you're controversial, you're going to alienate colleagues. And that means when a vacancy arises, you haven't got the support. Whereas Thatcher had just kept her head down, was education secretary, hadn't got involved in battles with Heath. And she, when the time came, was less experienced and sparkling than Castle but hadn't alienated so many people in her party, whereas Barbara Castle by then and, and pissed off virtually the entire party for one thing or another. Well, another and person, nice Steve, sorry, yeah. another person just on that very point if, uh, is someone who didn't take care of internal party management in terms of his own ambition was Dennis Healy from the same era, because Healy in the 60s had a very distinguished record as a defence secretary, then had a very tough time as chancellor of uh, during the IMF crisis, et cetera, et cetera. He, as he himself acknowledged a few times, had a brilliant hinterland, but he wasn't very good at internal market expectations, if you like, and eventually he didn't have the support within the, the party ranks to become leader. Yeah, although many people thought in 1980, when Jim Callaghan resigned, that Healy would be leader. He was favourite uh, in the media and early on in the polls and so on by miles. And here's another lesson, Rishi Sunak, take note. <laughs> Chancellors are always seen as future prime ministers unless they don't want to be like Nigel Lawson. Um, and most of them do want to be. Most of them don't get it. And Dennis Healy is an example of why. Um, he had to take a whole range of hugely unpopular decisions as chancellor in the 1970s um, and decisions were regarded by the very powerful left led by Tony Benn as acts of betrayal that emotive mm -hmm. term in politics betrayal and in retrospect he never stood a chance in 1980 he was seen by journalists as prime ministerial and he was this weighty figure, as you say. But you've got to have a you've got to be dancing with your party if you want to be a leader. And he had had a very discordant dance with his, as incidentally has Ken Clark as a chancellor yep. and uh, Rab Butler as a chancellor. Roy um, Jenkins. For others, Roy Jenkins. Quite mm. a few prime ministers we never had were chancellors who virtually everyone thought would be a prime minister and they never made it. We're going to go back to some of those names because their stories again are very distinguished careers, but they made enemies along the way. Now let's talk about someone who was never a chancellor, but was much talked about, and that's Michael Heseltine. Uh, so he, he stormed out of the cabinet, Margaret Thatcher's cabinet in 1986, although you correctly point out that he was a very astute manager 
of Margaret Thatcher at a time when other cabinet ministers were intimidated by her. He knew how to run his own department yeah. and get what he wanted. But he left in 86, was always tipped as the next future leader, and of course did stand against her in that 1990 election. Yeah, and incidentally, although he was burdened by the perception of sort of aching ambition, whenever he opened his mouth, it was seen as a leadership bid, he only uh, took part in one leadership contest. Most of the prime ministers we never had took part in only one leadership contest, Portillo once, and Heseltine famously in 1990. He, the more I thought about him and wrote about him, was a big figure. And you're right, part of the bigness was the way he managed Margaret Thatcher. He didn't do what the famous dissenting wets did, which was to launch coded attacks that so annoyed her, she sat them when she had the strength to do so. <laughs> Instead, he manipulated her to work with him on the inner cities project to actually spend government money almost sinful in Thatcher's eyes at the time and it was very clever the way he did it and it was it was meaty politics and I think there is a strong I, I, I often wonder is it exaggerated his impact on Liverpool and so on but I don't think it is in the context of the early 80s um, it was so counterintuitive what he was trying to do and he pulled it off. So he famously challenged in 1990. And I, A, it was too late. He had been hanging around on the back benches for five years almost. And and suspicion about him. Suspicion, he felt, growing, yeah, he's too ambitious. Mistrust. Then he was the one who became the assassin of Margaret Thatcher. And it was not going to happen. I say this book is not a what if, a counterintuitive kind of what if Kinnock had won, what if Hessel, but I do a bit with Hesseltine. I do mm. think that's the one that might have changed the course of history. In, in, you know, all of them by definition would have changed history, but um, he was an ardent pro European like Ken Clark. At a point, if he had won in 1990, the Conservative Party, there wasn't a single Conservative MP then saying Britain should leave the European Union. Um, and I think Heseltine would have had no choice but to challenge his party on Europe. And given his authority, because I think he would have won the 92 election if John Major did, Michael Heseltine could probably more substantially. Um, I think that might have changed the Tory party in its relationship with Europe. Um, but frankly, we just don't know. That's why it's not a what if. It's it's why did they not get it, these big figures? Well, staying with that era and the way in which Europe became the sort of benchmark, the testing pole, if you like, for who might be the next leader, Michael Patillo, because Patillo in the early 90s became something of a rock star and he was adopted by the Thatcherites as her anointed heir because he was tough on Europe. But as you point out in the book, he was never comfortable in his own skin, never mind in his own politics. And by the time he did stand for leadership, he'd shifted away from his hard right image, if you like. Yeah, in a way, he's the most, in some ways anyway, the most interesting character of the 11 prime ministers we never had. Because he's now seen as this figure in a sort of wearing a pink jacket, traveling on trains around <laughs> the world. People forget, as you say, that in the mid 1990s, he was the great hope of the Thatcherites. Um, and I remember you probably went as well to fringe meetings of Conservative Party conferences, the Bruges Group fringe meetings. Yes. And Portillo would be the star speaker. And the hall would be packed, mainly men aged about 95, uh, <laughs> but, but, but as excited as teenagers seeing the big. Beatles for the first time in the early 60s. It had that kind of feel to it. There were posters all around the room of Portillo. Um, there were Portillo pamphlets everywhere. And on his 40th birthday, he had a big glitzy mm. blue Thatcher spoke saying, we've got great hopes for you, to Major's paranoid fury. <laughs> and yet after his famous loss of his seat in 1997, he changed. I mean, he didn't change wholly. Remember, his Euroscepticism remained as deep as ever. Mm. Um, but he changed as a, a personality. 
he was taken aback by the loathing of him. You know, do you remember there was a book written, Were You Up for Portillo? Yeah, massively. He was that disliked away from those fringe meetings. And you could chronicle the gradual change when he went back to a Tory conference without his seat and he gave a speech where he didn't switch on all the buttons that got the Thatcherite right excited. And, and on he went to the point that when he did fight a leadership contest in 2001, um, he had changed to such an a point. He, he was wholly disowned by those who worshipped him in the mid 1990s. And they backed Ian Duncan Smith, who won. And we and saw how that ended up. We yeah. saw how that ended up. Well, <laughs> all their choices went badly wrong. You know, Thatcher endorsed Haig, Ian Duncan Smith, etc. But the fascinating thing was, you probably witnessed this as well, you could tell he didn't really want it by then. Here again was another figure who genuinely was, I think, uh, burdened by ambition. He wanted it in the mid-90s. But by 2001, he didn't. And the day he got knocked out of that leadership contest, he said, I'm off to the opera tonight, and then I'm leaving British politics. And so the journey from 97 to 2001 is a fascinating one. Um, and many people in the mid 90s thought Portillo would be a prime minister. And even he thought and hoped he would be. By 2001, he was ready to get out of British politics. That's one of the points that you referenced throughout the book is that part of the reason why these very substantial politicians didn't make it to the top, part of it was to do with timing. But in most cases, they just weren't ruthless or driven enough to go for the top job. And I want to take you back now to the beginning of the book, Rab Butler, who was a minister in the 1930s, um, stood in acting prime minister for three different prime ministers. Mm -hmm. And when the moment came for him in the 60s, he was shunted to one side. To me, he seemed the most unlucky in many ways not to have been chosen in 63 as the Conservative leader? Well, uh, lots of people, and Rab Butler himself thought his be best chance was after Suez when Eden mm. uh, went. But he was up against Harold Macmillan, who was a more textured politician. And Macmillan danced around Suez more deftly than Rab Butler. Uh, and Rab Butler had done this thing, you see, which Put him in a difficult position. He had been a brilliant reforming cabinet minister, but a lot of the reforms alienated part of his party. Um, from the very beginning, in the late 30s, he was the foreign office minister uh, driving uh, self-government for India. Amongst his opponents then were Winston Churchill and his own local Tory party, who otherwise adored him. Then, of course, he was that famous reforming education secretary, Landmark uh, legislation. Yeah, yeah. And people still talk about it. Um, then he was a reform, quite a liberal Home Secretary, not in the Roy Jenkins League, but a liberal for a lot of Conservatives. So when the moments came, the fall of Churchill, uh, the fall of Eden, and then Macmillan fell ill, um, Rab Butler stood in. He was, in effect, a kind of prime ministerial figure. But he could never, there were no votes then, but he couldn't muster the support um, because he had done so much. It was almost too much. It's in a way easier to get become prime minister if you're a Cameron or Blair with no previous mm. ministerial baggage than Rab Butler with all these reforms pointing to a potentially glorious prime ministerial career. Not a chance. Not a chance. In retrospect, I don't think he had a chance, actually. Well, 30 years by Rab Butler in very senior and proactive cabinet posts. So let's go to the last chapter. Someone who spent 30 years on the back benches, Jeremy Corbyn, who never probably in his wildest dreams thought he would be leader of the Labour Party. And yet, as you say, in 2017, he surpassed all expectations. And the Conservatives after that election said, 
this guy could actually win the next election. Yeah. So he was a contender. He was. And people have gone, so how, how could you put Jeremy Corbyn in it? You know, people, memories are so short. It's really interesting. I'm reading Gavin Barwell's book about his time as chief of staff with Theresa May. And after that 2017 election, they had endless sessions about how the hell they deal with the threat posed by Jeremy Corbyn. They thought he could well win the next election. You know, it was after the Glastonbury chanting and all the rest <laughs> of them. Um, Blair gave an interview saying, oh, I think it would be a disaster. But yeah, I think he could win. <laughs> um, George Osborne was going around telling everyone he's going to win. Uh, partly because he thought he was going to sweep, uh, Corbyn would sweep London. So it is, I think, you know, politics moves so fast. You think it's, it is the most extraordinary post-war political story in British politics. This figure who had been an MP since 1983, no desire to be on the front bench, no desire to be even a junior minister, becomes accidentally leader of the opposition um, in that 2015 leadership contest. And I think I put in the book, it really is the equivalent of um, someone playing tennis in the park one afternoon. And somebody <laughs> saying, look, we, we, uh, Federer hasn't turned up. Do you mind going on to the centre court of Wimbledon and playing in a final? That is the scale of the leap. Um, and he was holding, he had, uh, holy, he had no, leaderly skills why should he have he's given no thought to managing a team let alone the Labour Party and then projecting to the wider electorate um, so I think it is an astonishing story um, but part of that astonishing story is that 2017 election where I think uh, Labour made as many gains as they had done you know proportionately uh, in 2001 or something I mean there's some mm. quite potent comparison and so for a time he had a chance but i think one of the many reasons why it all went badly wrong from that moment on is that deep down he never wanted it and was frightened by it uh, be prime minister I, I i think he when he reflected on it almost felt overwhelmed and i'm told i mean i you know i'm I live quite nearby and Fred so he, he's he, he's so much more content now he's back being a backbench MP um he didn't like the media glare the people outside his house every morning uh, yeah. managing the party because as you say he had no experience in any of that he was the classic outsider and he cut he, he was not an actor um, uh, I don't say this in a derogatory way you need to be an actor to be a leader and so he, he was, he's actually, I don't think he is an angry person. I think he's uh, one of the sort of complexities about him is he's a rather sort of gentle uh, personality, but he loathed those cameras outside his house. And that's where most voters saw him walking out of his house, looking furious at those that being doorstepped. Ed Miliband hated, he told me of all the things, and his wife told me this as well, Justine, all the things that they loathed, the thing they loathed most about the leadership was being doorstepped, of waking up and seeing a load of cameras outside. But Ed Miliband, he, he wasn't an actor either, but he had done enough of the New Labour era to know what you've got to do. You smile. <laughs> uh, Corbyn, Corbyn couldn't do it. Um, in the same yeah. way, he couldn't handle the issue of Europe. He kept on mentioning Harold Wilson. There's no one less like Harold Wilson than Jeremy. Corbyn, he's not wily. You know, Wilson was wily to the end of his fingertips. But um, nonetheless, it remains a staggering political story, this figure. Um, all those Labour MPs you and I know, who yeah. have almost died to become leader of the Labour Party, and this figure who didn't want it gets it with a landslide. It is yes. an astonishing story. It's astonishing. Listen, see, we have a few questions uh, coming in, and we have plenty of time for more. Um, this is from a John Gertler, who goes back to uh, Rab Butler, very astute point. He says, surely what scuppered him was his support of appeasement uh, in the yeah. 1930s, yeah. rather than any fault in his later ministerial performance. And that's something you uh, address very uh, comprehensively in the book, actually, because it was a big thing. Yeah, it's a very, very good uh, point. And I, I do address it in the book. I don't think it's the only thing. Um, but you are probably right to suggest that it kind of condemned him at a very early age. 
uh, by the and late he made players. an enemy out of Macmillan as and, well. Yeah, yeah, and and Eden, um, who, who I mean, Eden resigned over it, um, and so he was on the wrong side. And this is one of the lessons about the prime ministers we never had that you become partly defined if you have long careers by your relationship with a single issue. And with Rab Butler, it was appeasement. It's very interesting in his autobiography, he doesn't mention, um, but it was remembered. It was a defining issue in the same way Europe has been um, in recent decades, mainly for the Tory party. Uh, Ken Clark has said yes. many times he has a new hobby late in life, which is standing in and losing conservative leadership contests. And the and main his problem, of course, as you say, was that he was very popular with the public, but he had fallen out of love, or the party had fallen out of love with his view of center European views about uh, the role of Britain within Europe. So it's pro European in a party. Yeah becoming more and more Eurosceptic. So it wouldn't have worked. I mean, in a way, I don't blame the party. It looks irrational to reject the most popular candidate. But when you have fallen out over, and there it's more intense because it's a current issue. With Rab Butler, it was about a stance he took in the late 30s. Yes. But he could never escape from it. Um, and Roy Jenkins too was in effect blocked because of his passionate support for Europe in the early 70s when Labour was then the anti-European party and uh, he had to resign as deputy leader of the Labour party over it was he was never going to be leader if you resign as deputy leader you're not going to be suddenly leader so no. <laughs> Europe uh, defined their appeasement uh, the, the questioner is absolutely right defined the way Rab Butler was perceived but I think in addition to that he got uh, huge plaudits, but also quite a lot of internal criticism for his reforming zeal at various departments. Uh, just when you mentioned Roy Jenkins there, he does feature in the book, and uh, unusually he sa you say that he was uh, mentioned as a possible prime minister for two different parties, because of course for the SDP, when the alliance was formed and it had that surge, uh, there was a possibility at one stage that he might end up being a prime minister again. I, I, I think he thought so. Um, I, I, I know quite well uh, Bill Rogers, one of the Gang of Four, his yes. daughter, and his daughter From tells me... Stockton, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Roy Jenkins and Bill Rogers had a long conversation about Bill Rogers being his chancellor uh, in an SDP wow. alliance ad administration. So I think there was a period in those heady early days where Roy Jenkins thought he might be prime minister. It didn't last very long. Um, but Jenkins confirms your thesis that um, the prime ministers we never had were just not ruthless enough. In his memoir, he says, I, Margaret Thatcher took a moment, Lloyd George, blah, 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 blah. I was never willing to wield the knife. And, um, uh, but actually, I think that is wrong. You know, Jenkins' big moment for Labour was in the late 60s when Harold Wilson mm. was in all sorts of difficulty to the point that Harold Wilson famously had to say during a speech, you may be wondering what's been going on over the last few weeks, I'll tell you what's going on, I'm going on. <laughs> and he had to sort of, you know, turn the whole thing round with, a, with wit, which he used really effectively throughout his leadership. But that's how big a threat Jenkins appeared to be then, and Jenkins said he should have gone for it. Um, yeah. And Thatcher would have gone for it. Lloyd George would have gone for it. I completely disagree with him. He was seen as a chancellor stabilizing the economy. Imagine if he had launched a bid against the prime minister who had won a landslide three years mm. earlier. It would have caused all sorts of instability and I'm certain he would have lost. And it's a reminder to those who are now seen as our next prime ministers. The prime ministers we never had have, have you know, I'm told Rishi Sunak has read this book. There's a profound <laughs> lesson, which is that it's very hard to remove prime ministers. Mm -hmm. Prime ministers are insecure. The aspiring prime ministers are hopeful. But Wilson, for example, that he said had to say that in 69. He was still prime minister in 74, 75. He resigned in 76. So he was there for years and years. Yeah, after stickability. That. You know, once Stick they get there, as you say, it's hard to get rid of them. And it's a question from Susie Cochran, actually, uh, which may be the subject for your next book. Uh, we could all join in on this one. Uh, Prime Ministers, we never should have had. 
So people in the job, <laughs> it's actually quite a long list, but we don't have time for that. But off the top of your head, do you want to name any names from this present is, day? See, this is a bit like doing a book on the best prime ministers we never had, because it's deeply subjective. So I'm going to uh, uh, avoid it this evening because um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's based on my political views, partly. Um, whereas I'm kind of trying to analyze uh, leadership. But I mean, yeah, I, the, you, you're right. There's a long list. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, there is. What I would, I, let me not yeah. avoid it completely. The current prime minister, it strikes me, <laughs> is although a great vote winner, which is absolutely a, a precondition to being a successful leader, you've got to win elections. Um, I mean, I'm, I, I used to co-present a program with him on Radio 4, so I know him a bit. Um, seems to me, on, if you look at the criteria for effective leadership, uh, uh, unsuitable for the task uh, <laughs> in, 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 many, in, in many respects. You see, you have to have more than charisma. There is this, this focus on detail. And although he comes into the category of someone who could tell stories, which is an important part of politics, mm. um, like Thatcher, like Wilson, like Blair, um, you, you've got to manage teams, you've got to be uh, capable of focusing in forensic detail on about 25 different subjects a day. And, and these are just qualities I think he himself would admit he hasn't got. Yeah, no, I, I would 100% agree with that because I think most politicians, even very senior cabinet ministers, underestimate what a big jump it is up to being prime minister. And you do need discipline, you do need focus. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, Colin Fleetwood has put in a question here to say, um, so Thatcher came through, you know, from being a middle ranking minister, not that controversial, apart from the milk, ex, uh, Thatcher, the milk snatcher and all the rest of it. Is Michael Gove that kind of submarine? He's been high profile for a long time. He is a details man. Um, do you think he might have a feature or has his moment I, come I, and gone? I don't think he quite meets the criteria. Um, uh, I don't think he's been that submarine, actually. I mean, he's yeah. stood in two leadership contests. Yeah. Uh, his most, both very controversial. Uh, one for uh, his cocaine partying, yes. um, which damaged him, I think, at the last one. Um, yeah. I don't think Margaret Thatcher was well known for her cocaine habit. Um, <laughs> and the one before when he, he uh, in effect, knocked out Boris Johnson. Yeah. Uh, so there's another I question here from, um, uh, from Michael Gallico, who's our chair. He's saying modern front benchers have a much shorter career than the likes of Butler or Healy. In some ways, is this an advantage or is it just a reflection of the way modern life is speeded up in general? I think it's a really bad thing and it's worth exploring why it is. You see, if you look at the prime ministers we never had, when it became clear that they weren't going to be a leader, probably. They stayed on in politics. You know, so Healy, when he lost in 1980, he was a loyal deputy leader to Michael Foote. He was then Neil Kinnock's shadow foreign secretary. He stayed on. Rab Butler, we were talking about the late 1930s, he was still there in 1964. And uh, one of the things I think it began in, in the sort of new Labour era, you know, when sort of Tony Blair resigned, a load of ministers thought, all right, that's our career so forth, we're, we're off. Um, and it's, it, it's, someone put an interesting theory to me, which is that in the 70s, living in London was much less expensive, so they could all afford to stay on in the House of Commons, whereas now, you know, to live in that capital they have to spend a fortune and who knows but it, no I don't think it's about politics all speeded up I think it's I think it's seen now as less of a vocation you know those 1930s giants some of whom feature in this book um lived and breathed politics you know from mm. their teenage years and um, regarded it as a sort of thrill to still be in a, in their 70s and 80s even though some of them did not become prime minister. Well, that kind of fits into a question from uh, Georgina Hill. It's a, from the people in the book, 
which of them do you think felt the most regret at not having made it to to number 10? Good question. Um, yeah, well, I think it is uh, two that we've discussed, uh, Neil Kinnock and Ed Miliband, because they were rejected by the electorate. Um, and it is painful in a way that I think none of us quite realise, you know, mm. because you see them again, you know, Ed Miliband's now a shadowed cabinet minister, Neil Kinnock had quite a good job in Brussels, but they are haunted by the defeat. And uh, Ed Miliband, I think, has said it, you know, one minute you think you're about to be prime minister being put through to the president of the United States, and the next you're trying to work out how to get to Westminster on a tube, you know, and mm. I, I think they, they, they will never recover from it. Uh, the others who were, to, to go the opposite way, those who became at ease with, with their fate. Um, I think Roy Jenkins partly did, although he writes a lot about his fail, failure to seize the crown in his brilliant autobiography. Um, but he wrote, he loved being at Oxford. Dennis Healy loved photography, music, mm. poetry having lots of time with his wife, who he adored. So I think they got over the disappointment much more quickly than those who were leaders of the opposition, thinking they might well be about to be prime minister. Well, speaking of leaders of the opposition, but in this case, John Smith, because he died, obviously didn't have a chance to test his electability in a general election. Um, anonymous uh, questions just saying, and I know you don't like counterfactuals, but it would have been a very different 1990s if uh, John Smith hadn't died. Yeah, just to clarify that, I mean, John Smith and Hugh Gateskill and possibly Ian McLeod mm. would have made the book as prime ministers we never had. But given that the book is trying to explore why people didn't make it, yeah. um, we know the answer. It's yeah. a very sad answer, but they all died prematurely. So that's why they're not in the book. Uh, John Smith, I have absolutely no doubt, would have won the election in 1997. Uh, not by as big a majority, but he would have won. And he would have been a very different sort of uh, prime minister. Um, but a very strong shadow cabinet, as you pointed out, you know, when he died in 94, all of the people who went on to be big players in the first Blair cabinet were already in position. Yeah, uh, including, of course, Blair and Brown, you know, yeah. who, uh, shadow home secretary, shadow. Blair would have been home secretary, Brown would have been chancellor. Uh, a lot of big figures in that um Shadow cabinet. John Smith, what he, he would have done is brought um, a confidence to power. Um, I always thought about New Labour, everyone you say about them, how arrogant they were. I always saw the opposite. They felt to me very insecure. You know, they had never been in power before, Blair and Brown and the others, and they'd been in opposition for 18 years. John Smith had been a cabinet minister, albeit in the final dying years in the 70s. Um, and he had, I remember his press secretary, David Hill, who went on to be Blair's press yes. secretary after Alistair Campbell, saying to me he had never seen someone with such self-confidence as John Smith. Now, that would have led to a very different style of government, I suspect, um, than New Labour. We'll never know. But, um, but yeah. just on that, Steve, if I, if I may, because you do touch on this in the, in the chapter on Neil Kinnock. Uh, so John Smith, obviously, was his shadow chancellor, and it's fair to say that uh, Kinnock felt a little bit intimidated by the confidence that John Smith had in dealing with economic issues. And then Kinnock tried to overcompensate by giving very boring uh, answers on quite small, narrow issues to try to prove to people, oh, I understand uh, how the books work as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mentioned Michael Portillo probably changed more as a sort of person, but as a public figure, Neil Kinnock really did try to change in a way that I think was counterproductive. Um, before he became le Labour leader, he was one of the most charismatic and exciting politicians in the land. I mean, as a shadow education secretary, he was invited on the legendary Michael Parkinson chat mm. show. You know, I, I can't even remember who is shadow education. Oh, yeah, whoever it is would not be invited <laughs> on the equivalent. Now, 
And then that exuberance went as his self-confidence sapped with the onslaughts, the 87 election defeat. And the build up to 92, uh, the, the relationship between John Smith and Neil Kinnock was very tense. And John Smith in a way had more authority because and Neil Kinnock was tormented by it. His personal ratings and opinion polls were much higher than Neil Kinnock's. It's why mm. Boris Johnson apparently looks every day at the, you know, the survey of Conservative Party members and Conservative homes to who's on top and where he is. Well, Neil Kinnock was the same, and, and John Smith became very assertive uh, and got rave reviews in the media, whereas Neil Kinnock was still often slaughtered in newspapers as just being the only job he ever did was president of the Students' Union at Cardiff University. So he overcompensated by sounding almost like an accountant in interviews towards the end. But the problem with that is, A, it was inauthentic. You know, he changed his hairstyle and never made any jokes. And B, um, it was, it, it meant there was no great excitement and argument. He had lost his sense of what the purpose of the political mission was. Um, and the, the was he around, was, uh, effectively, was he leader of the opposition just too long? And his yeah. message of change the Tories had changed, Thatcher had gone, they had this new guy, Major, who was a bit of a blank sheet, as you say, again, hadn't yeah. created too many enemies on the way up. Yeah, exactly. One of the many lessons, I think, of the prime ministers we never had is if you're leader of the opposition, you have one go um, mm. at a general election. And if you lose, you should resign. Because Neil Kinnock did it for nine years. And in fact, when he read his biography, he sent <laughs> The biographer a letter saying Christ what a bloody way to spend my 40s he, he you know and by the end he'd been there for nine years just talking not doing mm. you know Thatcher had the power John Major had the power so all he could do was talk and people you, you, people just get fed up with it so you've got to do it speedily you've got to look as if you own the future and you have one election to do it in and that's it now, I know you mentioned earlier about Heseltine and if he had become leader, what it would have meant for the whole attitude, government policy towards Europe. Um, there's another question which is saying, um, which of these do you think possibly could have been the best prime minister out of the selection that you've highlighted? Uh, yeah, well, again, that's a subjective, yeah. as the, the terrible ones. Um, I, I, I think... Hesseltine, uh, but, but you see, it depends whether you're a Remainer or a Brexiteer. Yes. <laughs> but let me put my hands on the table. I'm, I'm a, I was a Remainer, so therefore I think that the way he would have managed that, and indeed his interventionist instincts were very interesting. Mm. I think yeah. he was a genuine modernising Tory figure. As if you take modernising to mean moving on from a period of time, I think he would have move them on from the sort of economics of uh, Thatcherism. Um, and I think they needed to move on. Cameron knew it instinctively, but didn't really feel it. Um, he, you know, he and George Osborne's policies were uh, kind of in effect a tribute to the Thatcher, Nigel Lawson uh, era and Geoffrey Howe, who they consulted a lot. Uh, Geoffrey Howe was, well, certainly Nigel Lawson was consulted a lot. Um, so they were modernizers. I think Hesseltine would have been. Um, I think the Kinnock government in 92, is it's very hard to tell, mm. um, but it would have been a formidable government. He would have been fine in number 10. I don't think he'd have been overwhelmed, but they too would have faced a currency crisis. Um, yes. And remember the exchange rate mechanism, which came very mechanism. quickly after the general election. Actually, when you're talking about consulting people, it was interesting to to read again and to be reminded that Tony Blair actually did bring Roy Jenkins in for discussions yeah. about the nature of government and policies and not Jim Callaghan, who was the last Labour Prime Minister. And yeah. Callaghan felt very slighted by that, but he was, that was very an interesting upset. move, wasn't it, by Blair? Yeah. For a time, he described Roy Jenkins as his mentor. mentor. And it's one of the interesting things about the Prime Ministers we never had. Uh, in terms of influence, some of them could continue to wield influence long after their hopes of getting into number 10 had passed. And Jenkins is a classic example. You know, uh, Blair turned to him, but I think Blair turned to him in, in a quite ambiguous way. 
<laughs> no, um, they met a lot. And then he asked Roy Jenkins to do that commission on electoral reform. But Tony Blair, I know, because he in effect told me, he was never a supporter of electoral reform. Mm. He knew he had to hold it up there as a possibility because he wanted this relationship with the Lib Dems and Paddy Ashdown and indeed Roy Jenkins. He was never convinced about the virtues of electoral reform. And of course, it was never put to a referendum. It was one of the pledges that was never fulfilled. No. Along with uh, duelling the A1 north of Newcastle, we've just put that in as a local reminder. <laughs> this part is coming from Berry. Was that Steve, in their 97 manifesto? <laughs> Steve, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion, and I really, really do recommend uh, the Prime Minister's We Never Had, because as you've seen from Steve, you know, there's a lot of detail, but they're just great human stories. And also the book obviously is available from all good bookstores. Use an independent bookstore like Greaves and Berwick if you can. There are plenty of them all around the country. Before we let you go, uh, Steve, because you know Blair Brown and the machinations of that era so well, the BBC uh, documentary on the two of them, two episodes in, um, who do you think is coming out on top? in the public <laughs> presentation of what really went on in the background? Well, I've, they're all on the iPlayer. Yeah. I've, seen, I've seen them all. And I, I, everyone's raving about them. I can see that they're gripping and compelling. And I, I like the way the camera sits on them once they've spoken, so you mm. get their expressions yeah. and so on. But I, 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 I think it's, it, 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 it's fleshing out caricatures. So if you're saying who's coming out of it, well, well, to a lot of people, it's Tony Blair because he's claimed, he said, look, I'm the new part of New Labour. Yeah, <laughs> Labour. I was kind of the new, new. Now, who wants to be old, you know? But what does new mean? Actually, new often meant with him caution and timidity, not radicalism and boldness. A uh, classic example being, uh, you know, no way was he ever going to break with America over Iraq, for example. That was caution. And sometimes they were both really cautious. They were both products of the 80s and Labour losing again and again. But sometimes Brown could be bold in the way he dealt with the uh, Treasury in the... Uh, clever moves he made to put uh, the tax up to pay for the NHS rise. So, so I think the real story is a bit more complex than the one that has been played out. It cries out for some analysis, but on telly you can't really do analysis. What, what do you think as someone who lived? Yeah, I agree. I've only, I, I'm deliberately keeping it as a treat for for Monday night. Uh, so I'll have to hold okay. final judgment as a, an escape clause for me until we've seen all six. But I do think it's brilliant to have the two characters giving their version and then the satellites around them as you say I, I i think it needs a little bit more of an overview as to you know what was yeah. happening there's a Can lot to say... be said for unmediated uh yeah. interviews uh, a lot to be said but it it really does cry out for some context and analysis well there's no better man to give context and analysis and as this is the last event at the berwick literary festival not too far away from us but in county durham in Barnard Castle, you yeah. can test your eyesight, uh, go for a drive and see Steve on November the 6th giving his rock and roll one man political show. So Steve. Oh yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Jerry. Yeah, um, I do it in London every month and in Edinburgh when the Edinburgh Festival was in its pre-pandemic phase every day. Um, <laughs> and I'm always getting emails saying, oh, can you come to the Northeast? Can you come to the... So anyway, the wither. Um, it's a chance for us all to make sense of British politics more widely, not paying to this book, <laughs> but more widely. So I hope you can all come. Oh, okay. great. Steve Richards, thank you for contributing to the Berwick Literary Festival. Thank you to all of those who've tuned in over the last few days. As I say, it is a voluntary organisation. If you want to make a donation, the details are on our homepage or on our Facebook page. But from this year's Literary Festival, which was the 8th from Berwick, we look forward to seeing you again in the middle of next October 2022. Goodbye. <laughs>